Hello and welcome to part four of my lecture series, uh, my deconstruction series on Tim Bain's lecture series on the problems of other minds. And um, first of all, sorry for, for the uh, low lit room I'm sitting in. Um, that, that's, I'm, I'm trying to save uh, electricity um, in, the, in the daytime. And, uh, but daytime is, you know, we are close to the, the winter solstice. And even though it's always mid, um, it's, it's, it's sort of uh, half past nine or, you know, or going on 10 o'clock in the morning, uh, it's still quite dark outside. So that it's not very well lit, but uh, you mostly want to hear me talk, not look at my face, even though I'm so, so handsome, but you know, <laughs> um, that aside, uh, let's just jump back into the around the 27 minute mark of lecture one of the problems of other minds by Tim Bain. Other minds, and I'll return to this point in later lectures. In, in bringing this lecture to a close, I want to mention two further issues, each of which have an important bearing on aspects of the problem of other minds. The first issue concerns the role of intentionality or representation in characterizing content consciousness. Now, many theorists contrast consciousness and conscious states with intentionality and intentional states. Consciousness, they say, is a matter of uh, there being something it's like to be in a certain state. It's a matter of subjectivity. It's a matter of experience. Whereas, um, Intentionality is a matter of the mind's directedness towards the world, and these are two distinct phenomena. I think this contrast, this implicit contrast, is present not only in um, deconstructing this, and also the same was the case with Keith Frankish in my previous deconstruction series, um, that I'm balancing between my own metaphysics and somebody else's metaphysics and trying to clarify to me where they go wrong in, compared to my, which I consider a better uh, metaphysics and uh, closer to idealism. And what that, what that sort of naive realism entails, what, what might follow from that in his arc argumentation structure, right? So if, if you have, if there's a flaw somewhere in your metaphysics, you might go down avenues because you think you are allowed to do that because of however your intuitive metaphysics is put together. And um, so I might be sort of deconstructing something that I actually shouldn't be deconstructing because he shouldn't venture down there, right? So I'm just saying it sort of as a principle in, in the... So it, it could be a problem that I'm sort of deconstructing something and thereby implicitly accepting it, or, or you as a listener might see it that way, right? So at the bottom level, I am convinced that he suffers from what is usually called naive realism. That he has a direct access to both, his ex both an external world to his mind and a representation of that external world within his mind, right? And not only that, but that he has a perfect idea of that external world, and that inner world in his mind is sort of a kind of fluffy side effect that, that is sort of hard to explain why it arrives, right? Now, this is fallacious thinking, and I've, I've been over that a lot of times, right? Because if you have... If if you're creating, uh, I'll just repeat it, just very simply, right? And and I'm trying to actually get to a very simple way of explaining this, so that so so one can get very quickly to this paradox and settle whether or not the one you're debating with actually understands this, or is actually able to get there. You could say, right? So, let's say, I have experience, right? I, there's colors, there's sounds, and so on, right? And I'm not classifying anything. I'm just saying uh, there are colors, there are sounds, there are tastes, and so on, right? Then if I, at some point, start to say, okay, 
there is an outside. I must be referring to that experience, right? What else would I be referring to? But that is contradictory, because if it's outside my experience, then how can I experience it, right? What am I actually referring to when I'm saying there is something outside my mind? And, and you know, it, very quickly, you should be, one should identify there is a built-in problem here, right? Because if it's outside my mind, it cannot be an experience. Because only within my experience, or only within my mind, there are experiences. Exactly because I created that dichotomy of an inside-outside, right? If it's all experience, then there is no inside-outside, right? I, I mean, and I don't buy that, you know, um, uh, dissociation thing that uh, Bernardo Castro has going. That's just sort of, he's just connecting the dots and coming up with explanations that is unfounded in anything, right? So if it's outside experience, by definition, by definition, you can't experience it, right? So what is going on there? Why am I, why am I potentially deciding that there's some outside well if if i if i if i try to destroy my laptop here right i influence my laptop the the experience of the laptop is not going the way going away even if my laptop is going away if you get my drift right so that what i'm i'm i'm, I'm fondling about with is not making the experience go away, right? So whatever I'm doing there, that, that whatever it is, that experience might be based on, doesn't go away, right? The experience doesn't go away. The only place where I have, and I don't do this at home, right? It's a thought experiment, right? If I were to knock myself on the head or crack my head open or something like that, right? I have a very strong idea that then my experience would go away, right? So what is going on? How can one part of my experience not go away while another part of that experience, if I destroy that part of the experience, the whole thing goes away? It's because that you are experiencing... <laughs> oh, it can quickly get complicated, this, right? The experience itself is within the mind, right? All of it is in mind. You are just projecting it to be outside, right? You are working with it as if it is an outside. It actually isn't outside, right? But at the same time, it is representing itself, you could say, right? Or at least where it is, not what it is, right? The mind is actually saying, I am in here, right? But don't go in there, you will destroy me, right? But I am creating a, 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 a three-dimensional place that makes you, you're, you're walking inside that uh, plastic sphere that I mentioned last uh, in last part, right? And you, you feel, uh, and it feels as if you are in that outside world. It's just a conjured up version of that which the mind actually do not have access to, right? But it has conjured up this thing that works. And it feels as if it's intuitively, it's sort of the default understanding. The mind maybe even tricks itself into thinking it is the actual outside, right? Now, it can't be because it can't both be outside and inside at the same time. So it can only be an inside, in my opinion. But if I want to create that dichotomy between the inside and the outside, then I do not have access to the actual outside. Only I can decide that this presentation that I do have is a, is a presentation. It's a dashboard. It's an iconography of something the mind does not have access to, right? Because it 
if 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 you're saying that we, if if I'm saying an imperial empiricism and so on, right? Everything arrives through the senses, but what arrives through the senses are not the things I am experiencing, right? Elephants are not traveling through my eyes, or, or you know something like that, right? It's uh, it's 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 a uh, various stuff out there that travels through my eyes. The mind has evolved to create something. For instance, elephant that works towards the goal, which is possibly what we could call surviving, right? But that means what I'm experiencing. The elephant is not the thing itself. It can't be whatever it is out there, and I can never get to what it is because the only tool I have to get around with is my experiences, right? So it's it's um, it's kind of scary at first when when you really get this right it is kind of scary to think that you have a big experience but none of it is the actual thing none of it is the thing itself right even the colors because they are created from whatever you know light right and light is not the thing you're experiencing you're experiencing light you could say or a manifestation of light called the qualia color but that color is not out there. That's just the mind conjuring up colors based on those light sources, you would say, right? And light is not even the thing that arrives. That's also a mental representation of whatever it is that we do not have access to, right? So because in this fashion, you are sort of locked within your own experience, you can never get to an answer. Does other objects have minds? Because that which you are pointing to is an inner experience in you all the time, at any time, right? So you can never get to it. You can only have some kind of your personal experience of something, but that is not the thing you're going for, right? If your personal, your personal experience can never be upgraded to some external mind that you do not have access to, right? That doesn't work. So let me see if I can. Uh, it went in uh, in screen saving mode. I think it's 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 going, still going strong, still going strong. Um, so sorry for the sort of lo long winded. So it it might not be that simple. I need to work a bit on it, right? Because it, it's also a matter of choice of words and you know lost in translation and all that, right? So I so but. Basically, the, the, the inside-outside dichotomy creates, and, and, I mean, and if you don't create that dichotomy, you are in solipsist land, right? And that's fine with me. But then why are you talking to me if you believe in solipsism, right? Then you're basically sort of talking to your own experience, right? And why would you do that? Because there's only you, right? So, uh, 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 it's so, so, if somebody claims to be solipsist, they are actually not solipsist, right? Because otherwise, they, they, they are trying to convince their experience that they're solipsist. And their experience is just their experience. There is no outside. So, so it's sort of contradictory, right? So unless they are just lying around somewhere, not going anywhere, right? I mean, there might be some fluffy boundaries there, right? But it's just impossible to defend your normal actions in a solipsist mentality, in my opinion, right? You're, 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 you're bound to eventually accept that you have to treat your experience as an external world. That, that's the best way I can put it at, the, at this point, right? But this guy is suffering from that idea that this experience is the actual out there, right? Which is completely impossible, right? It's completely ridiculous. Because if it was, he would be everything, right? He would be he, he would be the thing, right? It, it, it's completely it, it's complete madness, right? Actually, it's not madness. It, it's a functional way to approach it, and I think that it's a default setting for human beings, and which makes them rationalize about in a way that furthers survival. But survival, what further survival? might be the opposite of what furthers complete understanding, if you get my drift, right? So it's like, uh, 
if if your experience has uh, evolved, let's say, right, and then maybe it's 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 a difficult to use uh, Darwin's evolution ideas within metaphysics, but you know, let's just go roll with it, right? Because I think it's the only th it's the only thing that actually is you can point to, right? <clears throat> that there's something going on. Uh, in that realm of things we do not have access to, which which we would understand in our experiential version as evolution, there might it might be different what is really going on, but our understanding, our interpretation of what is going on and has been going on, uh, judging from fossils and whatever, right? Would if we would call evolution. So if if it has evolved from nothing to something, then why would it be perfect? Why would it be anything? possibly close to whatever it is, right? It is, I might elaborate on that another day, right? So we, we will have to get into his uh, presentation here, so. In Nagel's famous paper that I mentioned earlier, what is it like to, to be a bat? Where Nagel contrasts sensations with intentional states. It's also present, perhaps in a more qualified and, and nuanced form in another paper that's done a huge amount uh, to motivate uh, interest in phenomenal consciousness, which is Ned Block's paper on a confusion about a function of consciousness, where um, Block introduces the notion of um, phenomenal consciousness by uh, identifying it with experience and implicitly contrasting it with propositional attitudes like belief, desire, and intention. Nagel and, and Block are working here within a tradition that Terry Hogan and John Tienson, the philosophers, uh, Hogan and John Hogan and um, Terry Hogan and John Tienson, have referred to as separatism. According to the separatist tradition, there are basically two fundamentally distinct types of mental states, qualitative or experiential states on the one hand and intentional states on the other. The former are defined or characterized in terms of how they feel, where the latter intentional states are defined. But they can only refer to their own experience, right? It, it sort of it, it it feels like this argumentation is presuppositional, right? It presupposes that okay, I have this experience, and therefore you have that experience, and therefore I can prove you have that experience. It it seems like <clears throat> it's it's actually based on axioms without pointing out I am axiomizing this. Yeah, I'm just. I, I, I'm. This introduction feels like a grooming chapter, right? Where you, you, you your mind has to accept some built-in axioms, maybe sort of a confirmation bias stuff, right? That sort of that maybe leaves the big questions in the wayside. Is it just jumping ahead? Ah, oh, yeah, mind, right? <clears throat> It's there is a this fetish with proving stuff in a scientific realm, right? You need to put this electrode on it and say, "Ha ha!" It pops up on the screen there, right? Therefore, I have proven. Um, but you just can't do that with experience, right? Because you need experience of whatever you're using to prove your experience. So you can't. It it becomes a circular argument, right? You can't step out of your experience and look at experience and step back into your experience and say, aha, there it is. <clears throat> when you're doing this thing, you're not doing science, right? Even though you think you're doing science, you're not doing science, right? You're just doing this shell game of moving things around so it looks like you have a scientific uh, or something similar to a scientific approach to getting to something you cannot get to, right? <clears throat> Find in terms of what they are about, what they represent. Now, separatism's had many ver venerable proponents over the years. It's been incredibly influential. But it seems to me that there are lots of reasons to reject it. And of course, I'm not alone here in, in pushing back against it. And I should say that... I'm not alone here, no. Oh no, if you were alone, oh my God, I would be the only academic and they would look down on me. I, I, I need to be a part of a bigger group so I feel more safe. <laughs>
you know, right? I can't stand alone, right? Nagel doesn't explicitly endorse separatism uh, in, in what it's like to be a bat. And, and although there are separatist elements in Bloch's work, um, his endorsement of it is, is, is qualified, nuanced. One reason to push back uh, against separatism is that there are many aspects of our basic experiential situation that are shot through that are essentially imbued with intentionality, or at least so it seems. Consider your current uh, perceptual context. My current perceptual context involves being presented with various objects, the computer in front of me, glass of water to the side. I can hear various sounds in my environment. All of these experiences seem to put me in touch with objects in my environment. They seem to have intentional content. They seem to represent that my world, my context is a certain way. This is true not just of vision and audition. It's true of, for example, bodily sensations, vestibular sensations. If you're on a boat, you have an experience that has a certain qualitative, a certain experiential character, but it also purports to represent your environment or the relationship between your body and your environment on a certain way. You have an experience of your body as moving from side to side, of moving around, of your center of gravity moving and, and the like. None of this is to deny that there might be some elements of experience that are purely qualitative, that don't have any intentional content, that aren't representational. Perhaps certain kinds of mood experiences have that um, nature. But it is to say that the problem of consciousness isn't best approached by assuming that consciousness is one thing and intentionality is another, that it's not best approached by assuming a thoroughgoing separatism from the get-go. And it suggests that what it might, that attempts to get a handle on what it might be like to be in a certain type of conscious state might be usefully approached by asking about the intentional representational situation of the organism in question. We'll come back to that point towards the end of our series of lectures. I just want to note it. I honestly don't really get what the hell this is about. I have to be honest. It, it, I might have an idea or two, but it, it feels sort of polemic, right? It, it seems like uh, maybe I can create two categories and then uh, argue for this, that is just... At least I've created two categories then. I've done something. It <clears throat> This sort of... Uh, half as science and half as philosophy approach doesn't this it's it's uh, it's not functional right it has to be philo philosophical in nature because this is metaphysics this is not physics right this is what this is uh, not about how you use your camera right it's about what the hell is a camera right how the hell does a camera work you could say right this is not a lesson in taking photographs or interpreting photographs. This is about how the hell do I get to photographs, right? For here, it's an important point to, to reflect on. And, and then, you know, to stay with that analogy, scientists claim to be able to analyze the photographs in order to get to what the camera is, right? And at the same time, they believe that those photographs are the actual world out there, right? So no wonder this is confused and weird, right? So things are much simpler than, than, than they may get out to be because they suffer from these problems. And they are dragging around these problems all the time in this is sort of half hour philosophy. And it, it will never work. It will never, ever in a <laughs> blue moon, it, it will uh, work, right? It's, uh, it's stillborn. A second point that I want to make is also connected with Nagel's famous paper, What Is It Like to Be a Bat, and his explication of the notion of consciousness in terms of what it's like to be an X. Most attention, of course, is focused on the what it's like part of that phrase. That's what I was just doing in the um, previous discussion when we talked about the relationship between character, experiential character, and intentional content. There is... Um... 
aspects here that that I think he's he's describing poorly, right? It's not like everything he says is completely crazy, but it is confused by stuff that that is crazy, right? So, in the way I I create a model of what is going on is there is a screen you could say this 3d world i am experiencing right if i condense that into sort of a movie screen so so it's sort of it's simpler to uh, you know approach right like a movie screen then then my mind is watching this screen the mind can't create qualia on that screen the mind can't create redness or blueness or whatever right there might be some part of the screen that try to second guess what should be on the screen i can't rule that out but the mind that is aware of the screen cannot add things there right now it might be you know a simp too simple right because it, it might be the case that there's some cir circumventing between the the awareness of the screen and the screen. When the awareness experiences this, it might add a color. I, can, I can't rule that out. But in the vast majority of situations, I am uh, convinced that the experience or the awareness of the experience on that screen is disconnected from what is going on on the screen. So if I'm experiencing red, it's not because the awareness of the experience wants that to be red. The awareness is exactly there to be aware of what it can't influence, right? Because if our mind could influence whatever, I might create something that is a detriment to my understanding of whatever is going on, right? And that's also a, a, a push towards a, an axiom that says, because I can't, my awareness cannot influence if I experience blue, for instance, right? It's because there is a manifestation of something outside that needs to impinge itself on me so I can be aware of it, right? Because if I could just conjure up whatever I wanted, it wouldn't, it wouldn't point in the direction that there's something outside I need to be aware of, you could say, right? Or a representation of something outside, I should say, right? So this is why it points in a direction that it makes sense to create an inside-outside dichotomy. But that doesn't mean that my inner experience is that outside, right? It doesn't mean that if I'm watching a movie in the movie theater, that is what is going on outside the movie theater, right? That is sort of to stay with this analogy. Okay, but the awareness, I can also be aware of my awareness, right? I can be aware that I'm experiencing elephant. I'm not only cognizing the elephant but I'm also thinking about the elephant, at least in some cases, right? If it's a tiger, I might not spend too much time thinking about the tiger, but I might just start running the other direction, right? In the opposite direction or something that puts a distance between me and the tiger, right? Um, but I can, I can mentally juggle the ideas of tiger and elephant and all, all sorts of things. And I think this is because I need, or I, I, it's advantageous for me to be able to Im imagine future scenarios that might pass or might not pass, but I can imagine them. And therefore I can, I can um, be meta aware, you could say, right? I can be aware of my awareness. So I am meta-aware, or you, you could say, I would say, this is what is conscious, right? Consciousness is the amount of thinking you do about your cognition. The awareness is the cognition of the experience, or within the experience, right? The, aware, the, the consciousness is me being aware of my awareness, so to say, right? And, and this sort of uh, slightly complex scenario is what I think this Nagel guy is sort of pointing to. If there is something it is like to be a human being, it's the ex extent to which they have awareness of their awareness, right? But what about a bat? Does that simple, quote, creature, is that aware of its awareness? It doesn't necessarily need to be aware that it's aware, right? 
it could just experience whatever and then have a one-to-one -one reaction to that, right? So it's it's it seems likely it would be a good working model that you know, the simpler the creature seems to be, the less if if uh, none at all it has of awareness of awareness or consciousness, right? But it, it makes sense to say that all creatures that has some kind of potential sensory apparatus have some kind of awareness, right? Of that. Otherwise, how, why would it have these senses, right? So, so th this is how I approach it. Um, and it's actually not that different. There's just one big hurdle. You have to ditch naive realism. That experience on that screen is purely within your mind, right? And you can never, and therefore, you can never use that experience of your your inner experience to get to something that is outside that experience. That will never work, and therefore, this whole endeavor here is actually completely uh, crazy, right? Okay. But and and that is the, you know, that is also what I think that people intuitively think of if you try to argue this. They have a deep sense that if I was to go along with this, I would have I would be locked inside my 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 subjective experience, and I could I could not say anything about what is outside, and I would be completely subjective, right? So I couldn't order people around and tell them what to do, and you know this thing, right? And there is something to that, right? There's some kind of humility built into idealism, I would say. I might not be idealist. It depends on how you are uh, identified. But let's say I'm closer to idealism than materialism, right? It actually creates a bit of humility in you. Rather than this guy or, or, or guys like him thinking that he has direct access to an external world and can measure stuff in whatever and tell people this is how it is. That's kind of crazy, right? <laughs> but we also need to consider, it's also useful to consider... The question of what can be substituted for X and the, what is it like to be an X locution? What kinds of things can have conscious states? Nagel's discussion, of course, is couched, couched in, in terms of organisms, bats more specifically. But we can ask whether consciousness is restricted to organisms or whether it's possible for entities other than organisms to be conscious. Let's call the constraint that's suggested by Nagel's paper the organismic constraint, just to give it a label. I'm not going to argue for or against the organismic constraint here. Doing that, I think, would go significantly beyond the scope of what I can do in this lecture. But I do want, just want to mention... To, to This is an introductory chapter, and now he's, he's talking about answers to some of these questions. In, in, you, you don't give an answer to a question that is a part of your whole introduction, your whole lecture series. You don't present an answer to a question in an introduction. It, it's, it, it seems manipulative, right? It seems you, you are, he is implanting quest, uh, answers to the questions he's going to present to you later. So you're already groomed into having a particular kind of understanding, right? So you're already sort of halfway accepted whatever bullshit he's going to come up with, right? And also this organismic constraint is more controversial than might have first appear for it's at odds with some influential views in both the science and the metaphysics of consciousness. The organismic constraint, conscious states are restricted to all, I mean, yeah, it's again this uh, academic thing, right? If I can't answer this, I, at least I can throw fancy words at it, right? <laughs> oh, man. Now, <clears throat> if I were to ask you... What is the moon, right? Would I need... Would you need six hours, six lectures presenting whatever it is? Wouldn't you just say, why don't you go out and experience the moon tonight, right? And then look at it, right? 
Just do it. It's a just do it thing, right? Now, if I said to you, I want to experience your mind, you couldn't do the same thing, right? You couldn't say, yeah, well, by tonight, just go in my room and look, there it is. No, it's something, there's something missing there. There's something you can't do. You are, you are shut off from whatever it is you want to get to, right? And no matter how fancy and how many words you throw at it, you're not going to crack it open using just words, right? If I want to experience the moon, I'm just going, waiting, sitting, placing myself in a certain angle and position and looking. There it is, right? Potentially, right? <laughs> I'm not experiencing at the moment. But if, you, if I say I want to experience your mind, I can't do it, right? There's no fucking way I can do it, right? So why would you think that throwing words at it would get you there, right? What is it about mind that is different from moon, right? Because if you're there sitting next to me, I should be able to experience your mind if I'm experiencing some external world, right? What is it about this mind thing that is so elusive? Now, this should point in the direction that there might be something fundamental you need to check up on, right? There's some fundamental thing because all I actually have to go with about some external stuff is my experience, right? And if I can experience it directly, I might take a step back and say, okay, I need to understand how I approach my experience before I start to throw words at the idea of me experiencing mind, right? Just an approach, right? To draw your attention to a couple of scenarios uh, which come into direct conversation, direct contact with the organismic constraint. But if the organismic constraint is true, then that constrains the interpretation of, of these scenarios. The first scenario is the split brain syndrome, also known as the commissurotomy syndrome. In this syndrome, uh, the bundle of fibers that connects the two hemispheres of the brain to each other, the right and left hemisphere, are severed. This is done in an effort to control epileptic seizures when anti-epileptic drugs have proven to be ineffective. So to prevent the seizures from crossing uh, from one hemisphere to another, the corpus callosum, this bundle of fibers is, is severed, either partially or, or perhaps com almost completely. Now, according to one influential view, this procedure, the split brain operation, involves splitting a single subject of experience, a single uh, stream of consciousness that the patient might have had prior to the operation, and splitting it into two streams, creating two subjects of experience. Now, the evidence for and against this hypothesis is complicated. I'm not going to review it here. I've written uh, and discussed this, um, this issue, the interpretation of these results elsewhere. But the basic thought is that patients seem to be aware of objects following this, this operation, seem to be aware of objects in the left half of the visual field, and they seem to be, in some situations, aware of objects in the right half of the visual field, but not always to be aware of those two objects together in the context. How do you know? You haven't, it's, you're, you're talking about that experience as if you have had that experience. You can merely, to the best of my understanding, uh, then you might want to illuminate the, you have an access that I have never had and never heard of anybody having, right? You're talking about that experience they're having as if you had that experience. And if you didn't have that experience, well, how do you know about it? Because they told you so? Well, a report about X is not X, right? I don't, I, don't, I don't care how many fucking reports people are presenting to you. This is not philosophy. Philosophy has to be done by yourself, right? You can't make philosophy from reporting, right? This is the, uh, yes, it has been peer reviewed. This uh, article in whatever. So therefore, I have to accept it because trust the science, right? That's not philosophy, right? Because what you're philosophizing about has to be your experience. Because if it isn't, who are those angels who have this perfect experience they can report to you so you can use it, right? 
you're just uh, you're just trusting whatever you're being told is the actual case. You can't use that as a foundation for your philosophy. Most of a single conjoint experience that might include or subsume both sets of objects. So there's at least prima facie evidence for thinking that what we've got is two subjects of experience, one of whom is aware of objects in the left half of the visual field, one of whom is aware of objects in the right half of the visual field. And since there's only one organism, one human being, it follows that if there are two subjects of experience... I'm just trying to get around this. Uh, this this is one of the, uh, the loose points. This is one of the... the, the where, where he steps in further than he, he, he should in his philosophy, right? He's trusting that the qualia, the experience of that report, is explaining to him how he should understand other people's experiences, right? It's evidential. You, you are trying to have an... You're trying to... I, I think... I suspect that he's trying to elevate evidence to knowledge, right? There's, there's no other way that he can attempt to do this. He's sort of uh, trying to open the door to, yeah, yeah, but, but, you know, some person had, you know, something weird happened to their brain, and therefore they had experiences, and they ooh, right? But it's based on reports, or computer screens, or whatever, right? It's not the actual thing. You can't base your philosophy on an interpretation of the qualia in your experience, explaining to you what is going on, right? It, it, it doesn't work. It's an appeal to authority, right? You, are, you must be your own authority on your philosophy. Otherwise, it's bullshit, in my opinion, right? That's why I'm so strongly a, and a proponent of not just trusting somebody else's philosophy or claims, right? You have to think your way through it yourself. Otherwise, it's just, I'll treat it as bullshit, right? As it seemed plausible to many people, then the organismic constraint must be wrong. I might add, uh, I'm sorry for jumping in this much, right? But I might add that, what was it I wanted to add? <laughs> My mind is, um, ah, I, I might get back to that. I, I lost my train of thought there. And there are things that aren't organisms, for example, brain hemispheres, that are capable of having experiences in their own right, that are the proper subjects of descriptions of conscious conscious states conscious properties so the truth of the organismic account would have important implications for our interpretation of the split brain syndrome yeah what, what i was what i was also thinking about is he is he is violating his own problem here right he's trying to screw around with the formulation of the problem so that he might create and I this sense that there is some kind of backdoor somewhere, right? Now, this is like if if you have never been to Rome or, you know, whatever, Paris, right? You've never been to Paris. And I need to somehow to prove that Paris is there without me going to Paris, right? Or maybe I can sort of think my way into Paris. Of uh, think my way to Paris and then also you know, have some ideas or, 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 or qualified uh, you know, insights into what actually is within Paris. But the point is, first of all, you need to get to Paris without, in order to have anything to say about Paris, right? If you can't get to Paris this way or the other way, it doesn't matter what you think might be in Paris, right? So why doesn't he leave? It's like he, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, when I have you know, dealt with the, the the problem of other minds, I will start to be able to talk about various states in there and various this and that, right? Just like, say, yeah, 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 there might be roads and there might be statues and all sorts of stuff in Paris, right? But 
First of all, you need to explain how you get to Paris, right? And if you can't explain that, it doesn't matter what is inside, what you might think is inside Paris, right? So what he's doing here is basically saying, yeah, yeah, yeah. If I crack the, the hard, the, not the hard problem, the problem of other minds, I might be able to tell you about this state and the other state and this is what it's like and that's what it's like and all sorts of stuff within that mind. Why is he discussing what might be in Paris if he first has to prove that he can get to Paris, right? And if he can't get to Paris, it doesn't matter what he thinks is in Paris, right? So it's, it's this... Uh, I'm very uncomfortable with this way of... This feels like a grooming chapter here, right? He's trying to, uh, you know, blur the lines and, 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 and sort of finding holes somewhere he can get in without actually doing good philosophy, right? So I'm sinking down in my sofa, yeah, I have to sit up straight. Um, let's, let's do it. Put another way. Let me see if I can do the last six minutes here and finish off lecture one. Very popular uh, interpretation of the split brain syndrome would suggest that the organismic constraint might, might be false. The organismic constraint also has important implications for certain views of the you know, certain debates in the metaphysics of consciousness. Consider a position called Russellian monism, according to which the fundamental features of the physical world have at their core nature, at their intrinsic nature, uh, consciousness, phenomenal properties, or what's sometimes called proto-phenomenal properties. So on this view, consciousness isn't just a property of human beings or other mammals. It's not even a property of that's restricted to, to biological systems. It's a property that um, can be found amongst the fundamental elements of the physical world, quarks, electrons, muons, gluons, and so on. Clearly, if Russellian monism is true, or in fact, any... Doesn't that sound like panpsychism? I don't know. Any version of the kind of panpsychism that it leads to is true, then the organismic constraint is false. But another way, if the organismic constraint is true or, true or can be plausibly motivated, then Russellian monism and, and panpsychism... Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's, yeah, yeah. It says, he says panpsychism. Right? Just views of consciousness more generally are in trouble. Finally, the organismic constraint is also at odds with certain forms, um, certain attitudes to... But what, what panpsychism attempts to do is give some kind of explanation of how consciousness gets there, right? Or a mind gets there, right? And sort of flexing the words here. How it gets there, it doesn't explain how it works, right? It's just there. It's it's everywhere, and it sort of condenses into certain lumps of, you know, um, of 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 cohesive mind stuff that sort of seems to uh, you know coalesce into something within brains, apparently, right? So it's uh, it's uh, it's an attempt to you can't. Uh, refute panpsychism because you can't get to what's going on there so it's purely hypothetical right you can never get to a proof of it because you need that mind established in order to think about panpsychism right so panpsychism is something that pre uh, what was it called pre predates consciousness So it's like you can't experience panpsychism because you need to have established that mind that is there when panpsychism is done, so to say, right? So and, and it, it's also these elaborate, very convoluted, complex theories that tries to circumvent the heart problem, right? Because that's what I basically think he's, he's, they are worried about, the heart problem here, right? All sorts of attempts at somehow to circumvent the heart problem one way or the other so they can stay in neuroscience and all that shit, right? Avoiding hardcore philosophy. But it is philosophy that is the road ahead, in my opinion, right?
for, exactly for the simple reason that the foundations of science is philosophy. Science is a philosophical approach to predicting what is going to happen in the future, right? It's not based on looking at tea leaves or anything like that, or open the entrails of the chicken or whatever, right? It's based on empiricism. It's based on knowledge, empirical knowledge. That's, that's the principle, right? And that's philosophical. To um, the possibility of artificial consciousness. Some artificial entities uh, would presumably qualify as organisms in their own right. They might have the um, homeostatic properties of, of organisms. They might um, maintain their boundaries. They might maintain, maintain a kind of bodily integrity in the way that organisms do. They might um, preserve their relationship with the uh, environment in a kind of a homeodynamic way that's distinctive of organisms. But some artificial systems um, will we'll lack any kind of, um, won't qualify as organisms on even the most generous or liberal conception of what, what it is to be an organism. So if the organismic constraint is right, then the possibility of ascribing consciousness to those sorts of entities would be ruled out from the get-go. But another way, if one can make a plausible case for ascribing consciousness to systems like that, then the organismic constraint would be, would be in problems. But you can uh, you can ascribe consciousness to whatever you want. Well, what what is going to make you available to make that judgment whether you can or not? But it has to be philosophical, right? You can't put some instrument somewhere and say, ah, the instrument told me now I can ascribe consciousness. It doesn't work, mate, right? Because you need your consciousness to understand that measurement. So it's circular now, right? Why don't you identify these problems in, in this? Uh, you're just cycling like you're not, you're just, you know, what's the term? You're just sort of, you know, steaming ahead, right? Like, oh, they're throwing, you know, this and that and the other, and I can, right? Ah. Uh. I had, uh, would say I had higher hopes for this, right? Would be in trouble. So, as I said, I'm not going to argue for or against the organismic constraint here. I just want to draw attention to a very uh, natural way in which one um, might think that the distribution of consciousness is constrained. You might think any kind of, uh, at, at, at most, uh, consciousness is a property that applies only to organisms. But if you were to think that, um, you would be making a substantive move, a substantive claim um, that is controversial in, in different ways within the literature. Let me wrap up by briefly reviewing some of the material that we've covered in this lecture. My main aim here was simply to introduce you to the problem of other minds, or really, as we've seen, the problems of other minds. <laughs> so now it's an overview of the introduction. <laughs> I distinguish four problems relating to other minds. The psychological, the skeptical, the scientific, and the conceptual. Oh my God, right? In later lectures, I will focus on the skeptical and scientific problems. Here, I focused on this conceptual. Why are you focusing on those? You, you present four problems, and then you will focus on two of them. Why? A problem that's associated with Wittgenstein's attack on purely a subjective conception of consciousness. I suggested that the conceptual problem is ill-posed but that it does draw our attention to something that is vitally important to any. Hmm. I began with the psychological problem. This is the question, really a question for psychology, for neuroscience. What drives our attributions of consciousness to other creatures? Why are we inclined to ascribe consciousness to this kind of creature, but not to that kind of creature? Why is it so important that you can ascribe? I mean, and, I, and, and this term, ascribing, that's not science, is it? If I ascribe consciousness, I am axiomatically saying, okay, I give you, I treat you as if you have a, a mind and consciousness, right? That doesn't prove anything, right? It's evidential or circumstantial or whatever, right? So why don't you just grab 
grab this and say, what I'm actually doing is I am creating an axiom. That's what I call it, right? You could call it something else possibly, right? That says, if I'm experiencing this kind of object, I am assigning it consciousness and I will then be treating it as if it has, right? Done. It's, it's so simple, man, right? Either you, you need to prove somehow that you can get to an experience of other experiences, or you will have to use this axiomatic approach. This sort of half-ass assigning, and this half-ass philosophy, half-ass science, half-ass whatever, I'm not buying that, right? It doesn't bode well for, you know, whatever we are going to do here, or you are going to do here. It's much easier just to say, I'll give you this. I can't reason my way to it. I can't experience it. Therefore, I have to assign, assign, right, an axiom. Okay, I think we've got around um, the, the last part of this. Let me see. I have four minutes left. Let's see if we can. Creature, why are we I could get, not sure? Let, let him finish what he's saying within, um, about. <laughs> within the one hour mark. Whether consciousness might obtain over here, um, but we are sure that it does obtain over there. We are sure that it doesn't obtain in this kind of case. What drives our judgments about consciousness? It's a problem for psychology. It's a, it's a problem in the sciences, as it were, but it's a problem that raises some very interesting uh, philosophical questions, some of which we've touched on um, here. The second problem of other minds is the traditional philosophical problem of other minds. I've called it the skeptical problem. Uh, the skeptic asks or challenges the claim that our everyday ascriptions of consciousness to other people friends, family, colleagues, acquaintances, are justified, are justified in, and argues that um, uh, in, in, its, in a straightforward form, the skeptic argues that um, our attributions of consciousness to other people aren't justified, that they don't amount to knowledge. No, 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 but no, 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 no. You can assign consciousness, but that doesn't make it knowledge. You have to do epistemology to get to knowledge. I mean, they, this sort of loose treatment of the idea of knowledge is worrisome, right? There's a whole, you know, area of philosophy called epistemology that deals with the, uh, the, the, what it entails to get to a definition of knowledge. Yeah, and assigning something doesn't mean you have knowledge of it. That's why you call it an assignment or an, an axiom, exactly because you can't get to knowledge about it, right? Oh. The third problem of other minds that uh, we've looked at, I've called the scientific problem of other minds. This arises, this, this version of the problem focuses on what I've called contested cases, cases in which we ordinarily aren't sure about um, the presence or absence of consciousness. Contested cases arise in the context of our dealings with other human beings, infants, individuals suffering from severe brain damage, perhaps certain cases of anesthesia, and also in the context of dealing, engaging, considering non-human animals. Interestingly, of course, the scientific problem of other minds is increased. Again, one, isn't it a circular argument, non-human? It's like those who do not have the same mind that we have, right? Aren't you implying, presupposing mind in that argument? You're not stating it explicitly, but it sort of feels like it's somewhere down there, right? It's already built into the articulation. Okay, and there's one minute left before the one hour mark. I think we will leave it here. If you want to see here his introduction to his introduction here, then, then go ahead. Uh, but I think I've done what I what need to do with his uh, lecture one, the problems of other minds. Please share, like, and subscribe if, if you uh, think this is good stuff. Also, if you don't think it's good stuff. <laughs> and uh, leave a comment or the, join the Discord uh, uh, below, link below. And otherwise, have a very nice day. See you in the next one.